Um, welcome everybody to our Black Excellence panel. Um, I'm your moderator today, Malcolm Thomas. Um, I'm the Assistant Director for Campus Activities um, here at Virtus. And um, I just wanna thank you all for joining us today um, to listen to our esteemed panel of various folks from our Virtus community, alumni, and um, people from our New Haven community. Um, so some may ask, um, what is Black excellence and why are we here? Um, well, we're hoping by the end of this, you understand a little bit more or have a broader sense of Black excellence um, from our panelists um, here today. Um, but like in general, the definition um, that we have for Black excellence is someone that is Black or portrays great qualities and abilities to make the Black community proud. So. Um, without further ado, we're going to just get right into our panel. Um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Shamane McAllister. I know her as Shaw, and a lot of other folks know her as Shamane uh, Shaw too. Um, she represents Irvington slash New York, um, Newark, New Jersey. In May of 2018, she received her Bachelor's of Science in Healthcare Management with a minor in Criminal Justice from Avertis Madness College. Um, while in the undergrad, she served on the Student Government Association as a vice president for advocacy um, and, as the, um, um, and as the director for student concerns. She also founded the Student Justice League, a student-led organization whose mission is to bring awareness to the local and global injustices in, to campus and execute tangible solutions as students. Despite Shaw's major in serving the community is her purpose. She serves as a co-coordinator for Elm City Lit Fest yeah. and podcasts. Elm City Lit is an annual celebration of books, literature, and literary artists um, with the purpose of enhancing literary um, while promoting awareness for local, regional, and global artists of the African community. She is a vision holder for the return to the people, a group supporting a new generation of New Haven artists and becoming self-sufficient, empowered artists and leaders. Shaw previously has served as a director coordinator for the New Haven Sympathy, Sympathy Orchestra, and Shaw is also a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Inc., a sisterhood rooted in scholarship sisterhood and service and um, inner womanhood. And Shaw, um, please um, deliver us your journey. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the BERT for having me. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so we'll, we'll get right into it. I, I wouldn't say I've had a journey to Black excellence. I think that Black excellence is rooted in all of us who are Black, I think by right, you are excellent from the jump, that those qualities and traits are already in you. Now it's up to you and your journey through life to fulfill that and to tap into your excellence. Um, so as Malcolm said, I'm from Newark, Irvington, New Jersey. Um, I came to Connecticut to go to Albertus and I've been here ever since. Um, I would say what got me on this journey, I would say it's the, my ancestors, seeing folks in my family who have sacrificed a lot, right? I've had, my grandmother took me in when she was in her sixties. She didn't have to, she was at the golden age of her retirement. And then to start over with a two-year-old, that's excellence to me. I think that embedded in me that I, there's nothing, there's no going back. There is no room for sufficient when I've seen so many folks give up a lot for me. When you consider everything in the history of Black people, all the sacrifices that have been made, it's, it would be unjust to not achieve for excellence and not to put your best foot forward always. I would say what helped get me from point A to point B is taking advantage of all the opportunities that presented themselves to me. Like many folks of where I'm from, it could have went left by just a quick, of, by an, uh, any decision could have led me to be a different person than who I am today. My, most of my family fell victim to the crack epidemic, 
those years took out majority of my family. My grandmother had five kids. Four out of her five kids fell addicted to drugs, which then their kids, my cousins, we all had to maneuver through that. We all had to take the best route that was best for us at the time. I can say that through any level of oppression that you hear, whether it's racism, a class issue, a poverty issue, I've experienced them all in some way. The prison to pipeline system, mass incarceration has had majority of the black males in my family. And I would say some of the women in my family as well, but I say all that as not to, as a downer or not as to be like, oh my God, but I've turned it into motivation because everyone's banking on me to do something. No one in my family has gotten this far. So with great, with great influence comes great responsibility. So I would say if you're on your journey of embarking your excellence and tapping into it, understand who's rooting for you and understand that you're not just representing you. When I came back home with my degree, folks told me we did it because we did do it. It was one of us is all of us. So I would say it's not just you who's rocking for you. You represent your whole community. That's a lot. That's a lot to carry for sure. But every achievement for one of us is an achievement for all of us. I would say continue to educate yourself. A lot of things that I've learned, I've had to self-teach. Nothing, a lot of what you need in life isn't taught to you. How to do your taxes, how to take care of your credit, certain things of Black history. Judas and the Black Messiah just came out. And for a lot of folks, this is their first introduction to Fred Hampton. I was blessed enough to know about him in high school. The sisters, I ended up at a um, an all girls Catholic school. Now this isn't no, you know, prestigious snobby school. We were in the, we were in the hood, but they gave us all the resources that we needed. So it wasn't about survival. If I would have gone to the local high school it would have been about survival. I wouldn't have had that time to learn. So definitely continue to self-educate when folks go high. When folks go low, go high, as Michelle Obama always says, because that's what makes the difference. You can't necessarily succumb to what other people are doing. That's what they're doing. Your standards you have for yourself are the standards you have for yourself. It might be, why can't I go do what they're doing? That, that's not how the cookie crumbles sometimes. So with that being said, you always, I tell the soul words, put your finer foot forward. And in all things, you should put your finer foot forward. I would say that's my black excellence story summed up. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Shaw. I'll get a couple of snaps over here. Um, but Does yeah, she drop thank the mic now? <laughs> yes, she came oh, in. Right. Yeah, I think that's a feature on Zoom to drop the mic, Shaw. Drop that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you, Shaw, for those words. Um, and to kick us off in um, our panel, um, so now I'm going to get into introducing our panelists. Um, this is going to take some time because they have so much on their resume. So please bear with me, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start out introducing um, Steve um, Griffin. I think, I hope I pronounced that right, Steve. Um, you can see his bio here on your screen, but Steve was born and raised in New Haven, Connecticut, um, um, born in New Haven, Connecticut, but raised in Brooklyn, New York and, and South Carolina. He completed his undergraduate schooling at the University of South Carolina and eventually moved back to his birthplace. Upon moving to New Haven, Steve witnessed the impact of drugs and crime in his neighborhood and began speaking to these ills by using his God-given gift of writing and using um, the, the median of theater. His first performance was a street play and that captured him into activism and playwriting in hate. Steve started working with youth and becoming committed to helping them and their families in various um, capacities over the years. Steve currently works for the Connecticut Center of Arts and Technology, um, we know as CONCAT in New Haven, um, as a youth and community programs manager and continues his passion for helping the community and um, Steve comes from a close-knit family um, consisting of two sisters and brothers um, who live along the East Coast 
and is a loving father to two daughters. Um, thank you for joining us, Steve. Um, next up, uh, we have our fellow Albertus alumni, Brianna Jenkins. Um, uh, given the title, um, Brianna was given the title, The Love of Children, The Love Child of Oprah, Beyonce, and Michelle Obama. Um, Brianna is a public speaker, activist for the LGP, LGBTQIA plus a female, uh, people of color communities, and has years of experience using her platform to evoke change. Brianna has over eight years of experience in the nonprofit sector. She has worked with for a variety of organizations where she was able to serve adults and children with developmental disabilities, single families, single adults, and families experiencing homelessness and has and was in was in development and community engagement at the organization that serves LGP, LGBTQIA plus youth and young adults. When she was let go from her first tech job due to the coronavirus, Brianna decided it was the best time to start her consulting business, uh, Brianna Jenkins Consulting. I'll have to plug that. Um, in December 20, uh, in December 2020, she accepted the director of development position with the Austin Justice Coalition. Um, when not at work, Brianna is very involved in the Austin community. She is serving in serving her second term as co-director of New Leaders Council's Austin Chapter Board, and has served on the boards for keeping um, boards of keep. Austin Who Fed, Austin Black Pride, and Lone Star Victims Advocacy Project. She hosts a podcast called The Tea with Brie, where she sits and chats with different guests very every week about every whatever topic the guest chooses. And I want to welcome Brie to the panel. Thank you, Brie. Um, next up, um, we have James Scott. Um, began his law enforcement career in New York City um, as a correction officer. After working on Rikers Island for two years, James moved to Connecticut, where he continued to serve as a state trooper. During James's tenure um, with the state police, he has worked with worked as school resource officers, um, academy instructor, um, parole sergeant, and ultimately commanding officer for the recruiting. James simultaneously serves in the National, um, Army National Guard for 20 years. He specialized in military police operations and is the veteran of and is a veteran of the Operation Iraqi Freedom. After 20 years of military service, James retired from the rank as Master Sergeant. James has, his, has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, a master's degree in administration, is currently enrolled in the doctoral studies at St. Louis University. After 21 years of service with the state police, um, James retired and assumed his full-time faculty position at Burris Madness College um, in New Haven, Connecticut. And thank you, James, for being here with us. Next, we have Judge Erica Tindu, um, appointed to the branch by um, Governor Daniel Malloy in March 2014 and was sworn in as Superior Court Judge on April 29th, um, 2014. Judge Tindu just completed two terms as a presiding judge for family division in the New Haven Judicial District. She is current the family trial judge in Mary. Judge Tyndale previously um, sat in the Stanford Norwalk Judicial um, Judicial District hearing criminal hearing criminal domestic violence and family matters, serving in um, the Malloy administration as chair of the Connecticut Board of Pardons and Paroles from 2011 to 2014. Prior to her appointment, she held the positions of executive director of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence and deputy director for the New Haven Legal Assistance Association, Inc. Prior to her, 
prior to, prior to coming to Connecticut, she served as an assistant attorney um, specializing in domestic violence prosecution in Miami, Florida. Judge Tyndale is a um, counsel for the state for state government's Henry Toll um, Fellow and the James W. Cooper Life Fellow of the Connecticut Bar Foundation. She was a 2014 Urban League in Southern Connecticut Woman of Power honoree. She has served on the Board of Domestic Violence Services of Greater New Haven, the Rape Crisis Center of Milford, and the Connecticut Humanities as director. She has been an adjunct professor of legal studies um, in the legal studies department at Quinnipiac University since 2000. Judge Tyndale earned her um, earned a BA in the economics and Spanish from Bucknell University and studied the European and studied the European economic community and Spanish constitutional law in Madrid, Spain, um, through the College of William William and Mary. She earned her Juris Doctor degree from Albany Law School of Union University in Albany, New York. And I would like to um, welcome Judge Tyndale here today. And lastly, um, I wanted to introduce Cecilia Vega, um, graduate student at Burns Madness College. He's enrolled in public in the public administration program. Um, Cecilia, Cecilia returned to school after 30 years um, in 2016 to complete his bachelor's. Um, back to where Shaw's point, um, education doesn't stop, we wanna keep going. Um, and we welcome C Cecilio back in 2016 after 30 years to continue his education. Um, he attended Gateway Community College and received his associate's degree in liberal arts. After graduating, he enrolled at Arbers in 2018 and graduated in 2020 with a bachelor's degree in business management. Cecilio owned a football a footwear company and apparel business for 19 years until he sold it in 2015. He wrote and produced a few independent films. He promoted nearly 100 concerts over the years at Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun Casino, the Oakdale Theater, and Toad's Place. Cecilia is currently working for the Yale New Haven Hospital's Injury Pre Prevention Program. He also works part-time at two nonprofits um, in Connecticut in Profits Connecticut Violence Intervention Program and the Youth Connect under the City of New Haven. And I want to welcome you to Cecilio to our panel. And I know everybody's tired of hearing me talk, uh, but I would like to introduce uh, the first question to all our panelists. Um, and that is their definition of Black excellence. Um, so we're going to start from the top uh, with Steve. Thanks a lot, Malcolm. Um, man, so listening to everybody's uh, story and background is amazing. And, and it made me really think uh, about the question about Black excellence. And I think Black excellence, uh, just to make it kind of quick and short, um, what, what, what people are seeing here on this panel, for example, is the end result, which is excellence. But to me, excellence is not beautiful. Excellence is hard work. It's grinding, it's blood, sweat, and tears. That's real excellence. The, out, the end result is what people see, but the real excellence is that work you put behind it. And um, so my, my, my definition of, of black excellence is the hard work that we have to do because nothing comes easy for us. It's just that the end result that we get to, and then that's what, that's what everybody says. Oh man, that's it, that person did all that, but they don't ever look at all the work and hard work and times they wanna quit, times they pride. Uh, that all leads up to excellence. So, um, I think it's reverse for me. That's my story. Thank you, Cecilio. I mean, um, Steve, sorry, you messed up a little bit. Um, Brianna. Yeah, I mean, after hearing Shaw and Steve, I think it's the, the surviving and the thriving. I mean, if you look at Black history here in America and everything we've had to overcome and being able to sit in this space now with all of us having, you know, had all these experiences um, and gotten to where we are. But I also think it doesn't have to be 
all like those great accolades, right? Like um, Shaw said, her grandmother being able to take her in, this black excellence, seeing how the, the black community itself really rallies around us and supports each other. Um, how it's kind of like this familial bond being in, being being black. Um, and I think we've been seeing that a lot in like the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's been going on. Um, so yeah, I think black, black, black excellence is endurance, it's support, um, and it's helping to make sure that the next generation is in a better place than you were. All right, thank you, Bree. And um, Professor Scott? For me, from an American perspective, it's uh, acknowledging the atrocities that Black Americans faced and still face, but using that as your motivation to propel you to achieve your goals. And then once you do achieve your goals, have the understanding that you owe and you have an obligation to help others follow you. Thank you, Professor Scott. Um, Judge Erica? Thank you, Malcolm. Um, I, I'm honored to be a part of this great panel. And I wanna say there's a lot of magic that comes out of uh, the Newark Irvington area. Uh, speaking of black ex excellence, here's just a few of, of some black excellence that's come out of that, that area. Uh, George Clinton, Tisha Campbell Martin, Michael B. Jordan, Faith Evans, Whitney Houston, Amiri Baraka, Bill Bellamy, uh, Ernest Dickerson, Gloria Gaynor, Sarah Vaughn, Savion Glover, Shaquille O'Neal, John Amos, Queen Latifah, countless uh, athletes, and of course, Shaw McAllister from that area. Um, those are examples of you know, celebrity and popular excellence. But I want to mention that, Mr. Vega, my hat off to you. Black excellence is coming back after three decades to finish a bachelor's degree. Black excellence is overcoming obstacles. It's persevering, it's being resourceful. It is not giving up no matter what in the face of whatever adversity. And it's celebrating uh, those accomplishments. The accomplishments don't have to be all of those celebrity names as, as my colleague pointed out, but just um, understanding that we belong to each other and we have a responsibility to the ancestors and to each other, the people who came before well, us, the reason why we're all sitting here to leave the world a better place than, than we found it. And I, I think for me, that's how I would define uh, black excellence. And um, Cecilia. To me, in, in short, um, black excellence is uh, possessing the unique ability to be resilient, to persevere and to overcome in spite of every obstacle being stacked up against you. Thank you to our panelists. Um, there's a lot of wisdom um, everywhere um, from all different places, from um, hard work. No one sees the hard work that's not, um, behind like the result. So no one sees like where that, like where you've gotten from, um, from like, they just see the result um, and like, doesn't have to be the accolades. Um, and a lot of times people are, we get sucked into viewing excellence as having that accolade at the end of it. And it's being persistent um, and, um, and we're responsible for everybody else. So it's not just um, we're responsible for who we are now and who we're around now, but also making sure that we're ensuring that the hard work of our parents and our ancestors don't go um, Un unmixed and unseen. Um, and um, our next question for um, our panelists who are going to answer this question are Steve, Brianna, and Judge Erica. Um, it's um, who or what has been or have been examples of Black excellence to you? And how does that motivate you? And um, we'll start with Brianna. Um, on a personal level, I grew up um, in the church. My godfather is a pastor. He's the pastor of Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church in New Haven. Um, and his father before him, uh, George Hampton, founded the church. And so growing up, 
um, for me, witnessing Black excellence in my church, we they started the Love March in 1971, and it's been going on since then. So be able, being able to come from that family of watching, you know, us create this thing that other people have really enjoyed, and how I kind of got my start into activism was one of the reasons why I'm I'm here today. And then also, I think as a little black girl who watched TV. I mean, obviously like seeing Oprah and always thinking of the stuff she's had to overcome and how she got to where she was. And um, also Shonda Rhimes, I love her memoir um, where she talks about the pressure of being a black woman in any industry of, if you mess up, it kind of means that you're, that might affect other black women who want to be in spaces. And so being able to watch those folks both in my life and in the public eye of uh, them overcoming things, um, setting an example of what it means to overcome things and, and be hardworking. And then also to con continuously um, create space and opportunities for others. Thank you, Brianna. Um, Steve, you have... Um... Sure, um, the, man, the examples of black excellence, um, I think that stems from my mother, my grandmother, and everybody else that came before me who, who sacrificed. Um, those are examples of the people I've met um, here in New Haven, the Anita Grubbs of the world, the, the Eric Clemens of the world, those individuals who have created things and uh, for people, for the people. Um, those were examples of just a few. There, there are a lot more, there's a, can even list them all of uh, people who've been examples. Uh, I, I would even go as far back as the, the my advisor in college who helped me through college of five years of college being a young black man who I found not too long ago after all these years. And, and I told him how he was instru instrumental to me to getting me through college as a young black man who was struggling with his own issues with fathers and everything else. But, um, and it motivates me, how it motivates me um, I could have been any one of the unfortunate people who who just did, who fell off who fell off the side to the side, so to speak. Uh, I could have been any person who, who gave in to, to 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 the streets or anything. I could I could be anybody like that. So it motivates me to always try to help uh, these individuals, be it the, the young people that I have met over the years, um, who are now adults. And, and to know that they are still striving um, and that keeps me going. So if those people who came before me, it inspires me to help other people and so they can be the best that they, they can be. And so, and I'm still striving too. I'm still striving to be that. So I'm not even, I haven't arrived. So I'm still trying to get to that, whatever that excellence is. And maybe we're not supposed to know when we get there. Maybe we're supposed to keep going just so we can be that unknown inspiration to the people that are watching us. Thank you, Steve. And um, Judge. Um, so like many uh, of us, my uh, first sort of example uh, and inspiration for Black excellence was my own mother. I was raised by a single uh, mom who uh, growing up, there wasn't anything my mother couldn't do. There just wasn't anything she couldn't do. Whatever it was that needed to get done, she figured out a way. And I'm sure lots of, of people have that, that experience. Uh, so that would have been my, my first uh, example, my motivation. But I personally am motivated by sort of everyday heroes. I think we live in a society, uh, United States society in particular, is obsessed with uh, celebrity and youth and money and I think for me personally, um, I am far more inspired or impressed with people who, again, overcome those obstacles. And there are countless stories of black and brown folks who have done that. And that's what inspires me. You know, it's, uh, it's a little easier when you have all the resources you need to do something. Uh, but when, uh, as Professor Scott said, when obstacles are put in your way, or, or maybe it was Mr. Griffin, when obstacles are put in your way, when you overcome those, you just, you know, it's like watching a track meet. You just keep jumping over those hurdles. That, that's what in, inspires me. So I really look to my community, uh, family members, everyday sort of heroes that just get it done and keep it moving. That's very inspiring to me in terms of Black excellence. 
Um, thank you, panelists, for that. Um, so yeah, Black Excellence, um, our first introduction to excellence is viewing um, someone personal to us. Um, and that doesn't always have to be a friend. It could be, uh, I mean, a family member. It could be a friend or someone that you see or um, an educator. Um, and yeah, um, it, it could be anything or anything that's going on, like what's going on in the world, um, that could be excellence. Um, and for me personally, it's seeing like people coming together um, that as being excellence to, um, to throw my two cents in there. Um, and our next question is for um, three panelists also, uh, Brianna, Cecilio, and Shah. Um, can you guys please answer, what are some stereotypes you feel um, that are constraining the Black community right now? And um, we will start off, um, we haven't heard from Shah in a minute. So yeah, we'll start off with you, Shah. Um, I'm, I was slow to speak because I'm simmering on that. Because when I hear of stereotypes that constrain us, that could, that could be any one of the stereotypes, you know? It's like, there's an array of stereotypes against the people, but when I, I think what's what makes it long lasting constraining is thinking about them or working through that. I think looking at ourselves outside of a stereotype is what's liberating in that. Because to be honest, these people are gonna label us what they want, right? It's they've done it for you, they're continuous to do so. So these are things that they've put on us. That isn't necessarily for us to carry but it, it affects us. It affects you when you're going for a job and someone automatically sees you as aggressive. When you're showing up, like outside of these braids, my hair is about big as here. It's, it's constraining when someone is constantly looking at your hair and trying to figure out, well, how is it staying like that? When we're speaking about my job, when we're speaking about something that's relevant to what we're doing. And so I would say all these stereotypes are constraining, but I feel like what keeps you constrained is getting lost in them because it's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. Thank you, Shah. Um, and Cecilia? Stereotype, I think uh, obviously the way we dress you know, people treat you a certain way. Like, uh, you know, I've owned stores for, like I said, almost 20 years and I always wear, I always wear sneakers and I wear the latest fashion, but you know, I can conduct my, I can conduct business business just like anyone else could. I had a conversation one time with Russell Sim, Simmons. He's famously known for wearing his sneakers. And I had one question to ask him and I asked him what made him do that? And he said, cause I can't. So, you know, um, I, I, you know, the music we listen to, and I don't know if this is a stereotype, but another thing that, that kind of bothers me is the notion that you have to work all these jobs. I do it myself just because I can, <laughs> but uh, you have to work all of these jobs to be successful. I think, um, not not work all of these jobs, but work really hard. You, you work hard, but I think you work hard and it has to be like focused on, on, on what you're working on, not working all over the place and busting your butt all over the place. That's not good quality of life to me. I think you should focus, be laser beam focused on, on, on something that you're good at or something that you want to be good at. And that's my answer for that. Well said. And uh, Brianna. Yeah, the first two stereotypes that stuck out in my mind uh, were lazy and aggressive. Um, and I think the aggressive one, because like, as a black woman who now owns her own business and does all these things, it's almost like if I ask for something, I'm asking the wrong way or I'm being too bold or, you know, but if there's anybody else who'd be seen to have like leadership potential and be hardworking and driven. And so like that constant stereotype and like Shaw said, like having to work through that and like not letting that seep into how I see myself, like completely turning that on its head. Um, and then like, Cecilia was just saying like, we work hard. Like we are not lazy people. We are constantly building and trying to decide what's next for us. And, and you know, I know for me, like creating generational wealth 
for my future children is super important. And so like right now I work a lot and a lot of different things that I have going on. And it's because like, I want the next generation in my family to like have these things set up because I don't want them to be seen as lazy. Like we, our people have been working really hard since we came to this country. Um, and if we want to take a break sometime, that's totally okay. Yeah, there, there's always this notion. Um, and I feel like us as a community, we have that notion that we always have to go like the extra mile and like continue to work and take on more than what we ever should be taking on. Um, because yeah, there, there's an opportunity to enjoy life. And sometimes it feels like um, because we're trapped in that stereotype, like Shaw mentioned, that we feel we have to keep working or keep doing more or taking on more. Um, and yes, that, that's one thing I really feel like it's constrained the Black community because we never get to enjoy each other because we're constantly working and it, it just never stops because we need to get to, um, I think um, it was Cecilio that mentioned, or Steve, about um, getting to the top or wherever Black, black excellence is. And um, we don't know when we're going to get there. So we just keep going and keep going. Um, and yeah, that, that's just a little small bit, but does any one of our other panelists want to um, talk on this topic specifically? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna jump in because I was itching on that one. Um, you know, what gets me about, you know, I said, what are some of the stereotypes you feel portrayed in the black community? It's kind of what my sister said, you know, it's that we always hear about what we can't do, what we aren't good at, what we're, that we're not smart enough, we hear all that and the problem is that stereotype is that we buy into it to a degree and then on the flip side we actually are smart enough we are good enough we are and we just we just kind of bought that bill of sale and a lot of our young people have like just kind of limit themselves um because of that and i think we need to kind of reverse that thinking you know so we just kind of you know fell into that trap to a to, a, to an extent Thank you for chiming in, Steve. Um, anybody else? But yeah, for our next question, um, it's going to be um, directed to Shah, Cecilio, and um, Judge Erica. Um, has there been a time where you or someone questioned your Black identity? And um, flip side, how did that mold you into the person you are today? So I'll give that a minute. and. Um, Judge, if you want to start us off. Sure. So uh, for me, that experience really came going to a predominantly white, um, predominantly white institution for my education. I, uh, my undergraduate experience was out in the middle of nowhere. It was about 3,000 students, 60 of us were Black. Uh, and I found myself um, on this island where I wasn't white, of course, but I wasn't black enough for the, the 59 other black students. So I was like in this, uh, I, I should say that I was um, raised in Europe. I didn't grow up in the United States. So for me, it was, um, <clears throat> a, uh, I didn't have the same experiences growing up that other students did that I went to college with. So for example, I didn't have the experience of uh, going to an all black high school or an all black elementary school or being in an all black neighborhood where I grew up or that just wasn't my experience. So when I got to the United States to go to college at age 17, uh, it was impressed upon me somehow that black was something that you, there's certain things you had to do in order to, to keep your black card, to get it and keep it. And I, you know, that was really confusing to me. <laughs> Uh, so, but I figured it out. I figured it out. Uh, but that was, that was, um, that was interesting. And, and again, I was raised by a single mom who did not believe in television, believed in uh, eating well and, and, and doing things for your health, not once uh, your body fell apart, but so that when you were 60, you weren't on all sorts of medications and, you know, self-care. And so I just had a, a very different experience in my uh, upbringing was a, a little different. So I found myself um, having to navigate that. And that was quite a challenge. Uh, and what I landed on was that we are not a monolith as Black people. We are not, it, it isn't that you, you know, if you ski and speak 
to other languages and didn't grow up around all black people, it doesn't mean you're not black, it means you had a different experience. Um, so it took some educating on both sides, uh, and which is hard on, you know, 17 to 20 year olds, right, to be navigating that uh, in spaces, not with your family. So um, that was an interesting ex experience for me, but we, uh, if I'm not okay, um, everybody else can't be okay either. I, I strongly believe we all belong to each other and that, um, you know, what's going on in New Hallville uh, has an impact on what's happening in Avon and in, you know, Greenwich. So until we get that, we will continue to see uh, what is what we see happening in our world. Um, I don't want to get too off topic, but I would say that would be would have been my experience of being trans. Uh, no, get, get as off topic as you want. I think people want to hear it. <laughs> yes, they, they want to hear it. Um, but yes, um, Cecilia. I, uh, I, I've never really been questioning about my blackness because I extrude blackness <laughs> everywhere I go. I'm like black, like I'm black enough for everybody, not just in color. I'm just saying I, I love it. Like they say, black is, is lit, you know, I, I love it. So I've never really been questioned about that, but I, I've questioned myself sometimes when, when I shouldn't have, when I've been around, because I, I work around like all white people, you know, and, and sometimes I question, am I being too black? And I had, should I tone it down or should I, and I just, you know, at the end of the day, I always been just, you know, I, I would be myself and um, that was always the answer, like in my head, like, I, you know, we, we have questions like, should I relax, be quiet? Or, you know, they question me, why do they eat this? Or why do they eat that? And, you know, and I just explained it and, and I don't, I don't think I was, well, I was questioned because you see my name, Cecilio Vega. So people question, how do you have a name like that? You know, in, 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 in you're black. So that was my only time being questioned, you know, and that was because of marriage. <laughs> that was my name, but that's it. And, um, Sha. Um, kind of like Cecilia just said, I've never really had my blackness questioned. I've there's definitely been times where I feel like being lighter skin, folks have attempted to disrespect my darker brothers and sisters, thinking that I was okay with it. That's not the case. You should know. So I've but then folks are just like, you but you're lighter. I said, Well, that that's nothing to do with me. I just, this is, these were the cards I was dealt. This is what's happening, but this isn't, this isn't a free for all. This is not, I'm just, you should treat me as if you're going to treat anyone else. This is not a, a, a moment that you can express or ask me questions that you've wanted to know about darker skin brothers and sisters. No, I cannot tell you, or am I going to tell you about folks' bone structure or why their skin is so smooth? God, it, you can't help it. It's genetics. I'm, this isn't, I'm not here to explain to you something that should, that doesn't need to be explained. Um, and I would say there has been times where I've thought, is this being too black? But then I had to check myself, like, there's no such thing as too black. Because what, what, how can I not be myself? How would I be doing my folks justice if I didn't exuberate us to the full ex extent? This has come through in my hair sometimes. And it's just like, I can straighten it and it's not going to conform. So it's like, this isn't for me. I can't tone down who I am. I, and I, when I speak, like I used to work at the New Haven Symphony Orchestra. Now I work at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. When, if you're talking to me, I'm going to talk to you. I'm talking to anyone else. So the slang may come out in it, but they say black people don't have a language. We definitely have a language because there are things that I say people don't understand. They have no idea. Like I can say, ah, ah, ah. And some folks will be like, word, I hear you. That, cause I wasn't talking to you. Who, who understood heard me. So I would say in those experience, but I think what keeps me back that there's no such thing as too black. Cause I don't think white people are saying this is too white or too Latino. Right, you're, right. You're, exhibiting who, you're exuberating who you are. So why should I have to tone down me to make you feel comfortable when your uncomfortableness is a you problem. It's not a me problem. That's how you feel about what's going on. Right. And I hope right. I can 
to the point oh. where there is also no such thing in our community as not black enough. Uh, and some of that is, you know, remnants of slavery and how, you know, we, I presume everyone knows the history of how we got to this light skin, dark skin, the colorism, the, you know, who's black, who isn't, who gets to decide. Uh, it should also be that there isn't a time, again, you're not a monolith, that um, the opposite is, is also not true. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Um, did I offer, does anybody else want to chime in from our panel? All right, we're going to move on. Um, next question um, is for um, James Scott and um, Steve. Um, have there ever been a time or a specific moment in your life that made you proud um, that you would like to share? And um, we'll start off with um, James. Well, I'm 50 years old, so I've been around for a while. Uh, different phases of life, there are different defining moments. I'll uh, share two of the most memorable. One of those being uh, my graduation from Albertus Magnus College. I came back as a non-traditional student at nighttime and I'm a first generation college graduate. And now I'm in my second year of a doctorate program. So for having parents that didn't attend college and then just in one generation, the pendulum swings the, the complete opposite way. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that, that although they didn't go to college, they made sure that I went and finished and they instilled in me uh, the, the fortitude to just get it done, even if it's uh, later on in life. And the uh, second, event would be the birth of my daughter. Although my uh, wife gets the bragging rights of carrying her for nine months, I get the bragging rights of saying I saw her first. And there's uh, nothing like the experience of uh, seeing new life come into this world. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And uh, Steve. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to say like Brother James, that the, definitely the birth of my daughters were like game changer. You know, and being being in their lives the way that I have been has been like, I tell every brother, make sure you stay in your child's life. That's something so so rewarding, especially if you know your children graduate. Um, artistically speaking, I, I like to talk, just mention. I guess I, I I lucked up and went to college. When I say I lucked up and went to college, I never was so, by all circumstances, I didn't have the academic knowledge or grades to get myself from the college. I was a knucklehead. I tell people all the time, so I was a different kind of person you know, when I was a teenager. And uh, did not, I went to school every day and didn't study. I went to school for all the wrong reasons and uh, thought I knew stuff. I thought I was smart, you know, kind of smart. And, uh, but it wasn't until I decided that what is a career day that they have in high schools? That thing they have when you career day. And uh, I remember I only went to school for girls. That's what I remember. That was my thing. I'm like, I went to school for girls. That's it. And uh, I remember when they had career day, you know, in the gym, they had all the, uh, the, the military on one side, and then you had the technical school and colleges on the other. And I walked in there, and all the guys, went, the majority of the guys went to the military side, and the majority of the girls went to the college side. That was a no brainer for me. I'm going to college, right? But here I am going to college with like bottom 10% of my graduating class I was, right? And uh, go there and say, yeah, I want to go to college. They rung my stuff up. Uh, Mr. Griffin, you're not, your grades aren't good. Your SAT score is not good. Da, 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 da. Everything was not good to get me into college. And they're like, you know, I couldn't go. So long story short, after spending a lewd amount of money on trying college applications in vain. One college accepted me and they, they put me on probation before I even got there. They're like, okay, you can get there, but here's the deal. And uh, so I went, that's USC, University of South Carolina. I went there. And uh, when I got there, now one thing I always did was kind of write, right? I was always good at like telling stories and all that good stuff. And uh, I thought that that okay yeah writing I could do that so you know how they take the entrance exam and all that 
and they put me in the lowest classes of everything, like remedial everything, remedial writing, da 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 da. And then I felt robbed, and um, and because I felt robbed, I had to look at myself because I realized then that I had did it to myself by not applying myself. You know, and then I also had to put the blame on the school I went to because they really didn't teach us, they didn't prepare us for college. So I was torn. So here I was at this school, you know, and, and Eric, I feel you. I went to a school with 30,000 white people and with 5,000 blacks. And 2,500 of us probably kind of stuck together. The other 25 was, I don't know. So, you know, um, so I kind of understand that experience. But I remember uh, I couldn't, they, they told me my writing sucked. They like, um, Mr. Griffin, you know, your writing's bad. Da, 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 da. I'm saying all that. So I pushed myself through. I, I taught myself everything that I need. I went to every, every health class and everything to get me to college. And I put myself through at 18 years old. I'm working basically full time, uh, put myself through and didn't graduate with the top grades because I worked half the time. But to say all that, last year, um, I applied for a fellowship, but I didn't get the fellowship uh, for, for, this, for this writing thing. And, um, but my, what, I, what I presented was hit the top 10% out of 7,000 people. So all I'm saying all that to say that proud moment was, here was this young man who wasn't smart enough, who didn't have the writing skills, didn't have what it took to kind of graduate, but did. Um, but I was able to hone my writing skills to the point where I beat out, I'm to the top 10% out of 7,000 people who were vying for this, you know? So that was one proud moment artistically because it spoke to me like, man, Steve, you accomplished a lot, you know? And, and um, so that was those moments. So that was probably last year's proud moment. There's a bunch of them. You know, that just the fact that I made it through, the fact that I graduated, you know, that that's college and continue to be a lifelong student. Great. Thank you, Jane and Steve. Um, and um, our panelists, do you guys um, want to share anything that you're proud of or any moment in your life that has made you bow that you want to share with everybody? My, mine would be the same as, as uh, Brother Steve and, and Brother James is finally graduating. Because like I said, I uh, I came back after almost 30 years because uh, part of my story I didn't tell. Um, I went to Norfolk State College um, a long time ago. <laughs> and the way I got there was, like Steve also said, nobody in my family ever went to college. We were, we were uh, encouraged not to go. They said people only went to college to get the refund, to get the, the money. Nobody in my, my um, family ever graduated from high school. My parents and cousins, nobody. I don't know anybody who went to school. Um, but I always wanted to go. And so I got arrested when I was younger. I was in the streets, heavy. So, you know, I, I, I did all type of crazy things. I got arrested. And then um, I was going to get sentenced. I was sentenced. So five years, suspended after three. I never forget it. I went to I went to um, New Haven Court, and I, I was I was there the day to get sentenced, and the whole community came. Um, came. This woman named Miss Frankie White. She came, um, and her husband and a few other people, prominent people in the community, came and they spoke at my at at my sentencing. And um, they they brought letters. I didn't even know they was doing all of this. So anyway, the judge didn't send me to jail. I had an acceptance letter from Norfolk State that I just applied just to do it. And that was part of my uh, case, you know, um, my lawyer gave him the, um, the letter and they, you know, I was approved, I, I was accepted to Norfolk State. The judge said, you know what, I'm gonna do something I never did before. I'm not gonna send you to jail, but you gotta leave Monday. I said, what, I was there to go to jail. So I went, I went to, he let me go. I went to Norfolk State, I stayed for a year and a half. Like I said, I was on my own. I couldn't, I couldn't have any help. So, you know, I went and then I came back and did some other things, got, you know, got the business and everything. And then after I sold my store, I just realized this is something I really wanted to do. So um, I was really proud when I graduated. I was re really proud when I finally did it now. Like I'm getting all emotional now because <laughs> I, 
can't believe I, re I really graduated and, and I have three sons and the birth of my sons because I never knew who the father was when I was younger and I try to do everything for them. I try to do the things for them that I try to be the person for them that I, I wish I had, you know, for me. And those are my proud moments. I was proud of you too, Pep. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think I could, I think I could speak to everybody. Where that that's so like amazing, just um, knowing that through any type of struggle that like we could still succeed, um, no matter what. And uh, the importance of education, um, like regardless of like finishing in four years, but just finishing is just a proud moment, no matter where you're at in life. Um, and yeah, I want to make sure like people remember that like hey if you're not considering like taking your next step in your education um consider it like uh, don't leave anything on the table um, so yeah and it doesn't matter when you go back that's black excellence so, that is exactly what what this is about in my opinion that right there 100 percent and um as we like Right now, I think this is a great segue for um, advice. Uh, what advice would you give the people on this call or um, any young person, or they don't even have to be young, or just someone um, who you feel like would need this advice? Um, what would you give? Um, and we could start with, um, yeah, we'll, we'll give it a minute because that, that's a very large question right now, but um, we'll start with Bri Brianna. Um, <clears throat> I, I have two. Um, the first is something I wish I would have said to younger me, and it was like, you're enough, you're worthy, you deserve everything that you want in life. Um, and then after hearing the three gentlemen that just spoke, it's like, if you don't see it, be it, be that example. You know, if you haven't seen someone else do it, you can do it yourself. And um, Professor Scott? Don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone in pursuit of your dreams. I'm originally from New York. I couldn't get hired by a police department in New York. The only reason I came to Connecticut because it was the first police department that was willing to hire me. I didn't have any family, any friends, didn't know anything about Connecticut. And I just came here to the academy. I didn't even have a place to live. And I just figured it out. So step outside of your comfort zone if necessary. Uh, Judge Erica. My advice would be to not take uh, advice from someone who you wouldn't want to trade places with. And uh, Cecilia? My advice would be anything lost can be found again, except for wasted time. So you got to get real serious. And it's a lonely road to success. Sometimes you got to deviate from the crowd and do your own thing and feel good about it. Sha? I have two things. One piggybacks off of what Mr. Vega just said. You are the company you keep. And everything that's for you is necessarily for someone else. Everyone has their own journey. So understand that being alone isn't a bad thing. You have to have a season of aloneness and alone time so that most, most things are done close knit in the dark with the door closed. So you have that time is necessary, which leads me to I, if you are in spiritual or whatever, whoever your God may be, tap into that because that will be what has carried you. God has intervened in my life on several different occasions i shouldn't be here i really shouldn't everything was stacked against me so whoever or whatever that may be for you tap into that because at the end of the day that's what's banking on you that's your unlimited source and steve um two, yeah i would have two things also one would be don't ever quit um and the second thing is not to take advice, but always look for good counsel. Um, anybody can give you good advice, but good counsel is far better than advice. So look for good counsel, not just advice. 
it's funny, Steve, I was about to mention that because I didn't hear it yet. And yes, good counsel and um, just listening in general. Um, sometimes we don't do enough of that. We're always constantly speaking and talking, um, but listen and understand um, what people are saying, uh, whether it's advice, good counsel, um, there's some truth to what they're saying and you just have to find that truth yourself. Um, I don't think, I, did I miss anybody? It's hard, it's hard over Zoom. Can't just see a whole bunch of faces at one time. I have to flip through them. I think I have everybody. Um, but yes, um, like I mentioned before, um, if anybody has any questions, um, type it in the chat. Um, we're going to give some time at the end of um, our closing remarks in our reflection um, from Dr. Patricia Buongi. Um, and to give you a nice intro, um, Patricia. Um, so Patricia serves as a program director for the Masters of Public Administration program here at Albertus. Um, she is also proudly from Uganda, a country located in East Africa. Prior to her birth, she earned her bachelor's degree from Macquarie University in Kapala, um, and therefore earned both her graduate degrees from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, Dr. Bronji is committed to creating, creating and learning environment, committed to creating a learning environment that encourages students to approach learning with unbridled, um, ah, with um, unbridled, bride-led exploration, um, a sense of connection and confidence and ability to use their, the knowledge gained to make positive change in their communities. That was a mouthful, um, a lot of talking today, but um, without further ado, um, Dr. Brunch. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, and you did not totally um, butcher my alma mater at all. <laughs> no. That was a, <laughs> I practiced that was that. a great I practiced attempt. <laughs> A, A for effort. <laughs> but yeah, um, thank you to all our esteemed panelists. Thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I can speak for everyone that this has been amazing just to listen to real people and their experiences um, and to take something, however small, that everyone, I'm sure everyone has taken something out of this discussion. Um, and just to uh, reiterate some of the things that have been said, uh, one of the things that really stood out for me um, when I started thinking about Black excellence, what is Black excellence? Uh, but really, you guys have brought it to brought it home in a sense. Uh, but one of the things that really stood out was the fact that Black excellence is rooted in all of us, Sure mentioned. Um, we're all born with it. It's not something we have to um, really strive so much for we've been told um historically that we have to like work three times as hard as ever but really we are born excellent and just as Sean mentioned we just have to tap into that excellence um, and encourage others to tap into their excellence um, and then black excellence is about is not so much about the celebrity um, but about the hard work behind the scenes um, and really encouraging and rallying around each other as a community to achieve those things that we, um, we, we want to see in each other, in a sense. And uh, it, doing all that while acknowledging all the um, atrocities that um, our history is embedded in, doing all that in spite of our history, in a sense. Um, we as Black people are, are more than the tragedies associated with, let's say, um, with racist ideals in around the world. As mentioned, I am from Uganda. Racist ideals are not just a, an American thing, a US thing. They're uh, a worldwide thing. But we are all more than that. Uh, we are creative, we are trailblazers, we are leaders in all our various capacities. We're essential, we are passionate uh, about our families and our communities and about our work. Um, and we inspire, we're inspiring due to our resilience and our strength amidst all these great um, adversities. Um, you guys were great at mentioning um, the examples of black excellence. And as usual, it's usually our parents, our community, our teachers. Um, and one um, aspect that um, one of us, uh, one of the panelists mentioned was um, the, 
the role of the Black church um, that has really rallied around Black people and um, through the civil rights movement has been a real, um, a, a real movement, a real force behind our excellence in a sense. Um, and then we talked about the stereotypes and I like the fact that um, I think one of the panelists talked about the fact that we have, there are so many stereotypes that are against us, right, as black people, but we have to see ourselves pass beyond those stereotypes. And, um, and then we have to, um, we have to acknowledge even that amongst ourselves, we're not a monolith. We have to see and appreciate um, the diversity amongst ourselves. And I really um, related with Judge Tyndall's example. I grew up in Uganda, coming to the United States for college. And there's so many times <laughs> I, in a sense, had to question my blackness because I, I came into a country where being black was associated with having all this knowledge and experience associated with slavery, with that background of slavery. But I knew about it through the books, but I did not have that firsthand experience. And so I hadn't, I hadn't developed that passion for the movement. So I was judged by that. So for some reason I wasn't black enough, although, oh, you know, I, for some, I thought I was, uh, I might have thought I was blacker than most because I'm from Africa. <laughs> so I had to be educated about that as well. Uh, but so many instances, I found myself defending the fact that I'm, you know, I'm black. I might not have grown up here, but I'm black. So um, I just want to encourage us to open our minds and to appreciate that diversity, even among black people. Um, the whole colorism situation, that's a whole uh, discussion for another time. Um, and then I obviously um, appreciated all the proud black moments, all the moments um, that the panelists were really proud about, especially moments about their families, about their, their kids graduating, coming back to school after so many years. Those are definitely commendable moments that every one of us has, um, has to be proud of, um, proud of individually, but proud of as a community because we, um, every like sure I think sure talked about like what an achievement for one of us is an achievement for all of us so we rally and celebrate each other's achievements every time um and as far as advice um one of the all the advice was amazing but something that stood out to me was um if you don't see an example be that example so for most of us for a lot of us we might have grown up in situations where we did not see those examples but we have to come to a point where uh, we, we, we grow to a point where we decide to be the examples that we, that we needed, to be the help that we needed. Um, so for example, for me growing up in Uganda, um, school was all about memorization and not so much about developing thinking skills and supporting students. So because I did not have that, I'm really passionate about giving that to my students. So I, I, I've decided as an educator to be that support system that I wish I'd had as a student. Um, and then obviously that do not quit no matter what, how many no's you get, you only need one yes in a sense. And then look, always look for good counsel. There's always, there's counsel in the community. Um, there's counsel even amongst people who may not look like you. Um, get out of your, the boxes that people put out, uh, put you in and think bigger, think wider. So ultimately, um, Black excellence, what I've heard ultimately is that Black excellence is a mindset, uh, my, a mindset backed by continuous hard work, innovative action, and the willingness to look within ourselves and act in ways that progress our communities um, while acknowledging the perpetual effects of our history um, and ceaselessly advocating for the rights of everyone, including ourselves. Um, I hope I haven't left any other things out. Those were my summaries that I had, but I'm really grateful that, um, that we had such an excellent panel. Um, so at this time, I guess we'll open it up to the floor for discussion. Questions from the audience. Yes, and I had one question come in um, and any panelists can answer this. Um, what are some, what are the most helpful things non-Black people can do to support those uh, who are striving for Black excellence. 
Malcolm, what was the question? What can non-Black people do to help those that are striving for Black excellence? What was the question? Yes, or, or to support. Uh, where, um, what are the most helpful things non-Black people can do to support those striving for Black excellence? Get out of the way. <laughs> well, treat us as, a, as an equal. Judge Tindall, can you expound on that, please? Yes. How much time do I have? You have plenty. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, you know, think for a moment, even just in the stories that we've heard this evening about the hoops of fire some of us have had to jump through, the obstacles we've had to overcome, many of which were put there, some by folks who look like us, but many of which were put there by non-whites who don't have any idea about black excellence. It may not even be in their lexicon. They may not understand that it is all around them. Uh, imagine if those people had simply stayed out of the way, just get out of the way. Um, what, what a difference that would have made. And I'm going to chime in real quick too. Um, don't encourage the stereotypes. Um, that, that's my biggest thing. Uh, because if we want to encourage Black excellence, um, it's discouraging those stereotypes that was um, answered um, earlier. I would say whenever you have the opportunity to uh, provide support and encouragement, encourage people. I know for myself, when I came back to Alberta, so I have been out of school for a very long time. And uh, my faculty advisor who was a white male, white Irish male. He sat me down and said, we can figure it out. Don't look at the uh, graduation date. So we'll just take one class at a time. And he supported me all along. And now 20 years later, we, we share an office. So just be there to support people when you can. And uh, we had another question come in and you could answer any of these questions. If you wanna go back to a question, you can. Um, but someone asked, are you able to stay grounded in your morals and beliefs with every accomplishment you attain? Well, get that- Absolutely. Oh, Steve, no. no. Absolutely, I could jump. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a, there's a biblical saying that pride becomes before the fall. You know, and um, that it brings true. It's just like we don't have the we, we shouldn't have the you know mindset of of thinking that we are better than or forget where we've come from. Um, you know, what we have is really all through grace and mercy and and just you know God's blessings. So you know what we've worked for. Let's just always know we got to pay it forward. So don't ever think that you've arrived or. <laughs> I've learned some of the most important stories from homeless people. You know, some lessons I've learned from people that I thought would never be able to offer, you know what I'm saying? So so that always kept me inside. Listen, Steve, you ain't no better than that next man. And you just really, you can just really trade places at one stroke of a, anything, you know? So I put it grounded that I'm just not any better, but I just hope that I can always help people. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, it's, you're you have to stay humbled because everything that's happening great things you got to keep a, a selfless mindset a service-based mindset because you could be popping right now but as many folks experience in 2020 you could get it could get real regular real quick <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said you always give thanks for everything that you're given or anything you accomplish you rever in it but you don't swim in it because that's not that's not for you you never give yourself your own flowers and you don't write your own reviews um and to piggyback from the last question of when um um from what judge erica said when we say get out of our way it's truly we're, we're really saying get out of our way because there's been things that have happened through time that manipulation has been the key. When we say get it right way, when you see someone excelling, it's not to go against the grain or to do something intentionally to stop them. I think natural competition is it's good, 
because it's natural. But I think anything that's malice or anything that's on purpose is you being in the way. Any other comments from either of those questions from our panelists? Yeah, I would say open open up doors. If you're a white ally and you have the ability to, to open up a door, that's what you do. Because at many times there are doors that are closed or you just kind of, I don't know, I'm gonna say willful ignorance. You know, so just open up doors. If you really want people, you see people really striving, why would you block that? And especially if you have the opportunity to have someone continue their trajectory. So be that be that resource. Right. And in opening these doors, understand that it's not a, it, these doors aren't closed based off of an issue of capability or talent. They're inherently closed so that that talent and that excellence isn't seen. So when you support Absolutely. your when you support your black friends or friends of color, meet them as people. No one's we're not looking for pity or no type of sympathy. We want opportunity and the same things that everyone else is allotted. Well said from everybody. Oh, um, can I add something small, Malcolm? Yes, of course you can. <laughs> no, um, I, would see, I would say something else, because um, we all work for an organization of, of some sort, um, just examining the policies that may have been there forever, that have been, um, that have perpetuated that whole discrimination or holding um, black people of color back. So just looking back at those policy needs in your organization, hiring policies, whatever it is, in whatever sphere of influence you're in and changing those policies can be another way to help. Yes, thank you everybody for um, those words. And um, if anybody else, um, we'll give it one more minute if anybody wants to, un Brave and unmute that mic um, or comment in the chat. But I'm pressing everybody be brave, unmute the mic, um, be vocal uh, about if you have any um, questions or if you just want to say hello and um, thank our panelists because um, I could thank them all I can. Um, but coming from everybody that's on the call, um, that means a lot more. Um. Um, for me, I'm a freshman at Albertus and I'm from Zambia. So I spent most like 10% of my time trying looking for inspiration, looking for women who come from like Africa and Zambia who can inspire me. And then I, I don't, I'll, I'll find inspiration from other black women, but then I like, I, I can't relate to that situation, but today I'm told to be that example that's not there. And I can't think are the panelists enough for this? Thank you. Thank you for being brave. Thank you. Hey, Malcolm. Hey, Sister. Sister Rosemary, Sister Ann, thank you so much to our speakers tonight. And what we both appreciated was speaking from the heart. That was very evident. So we want to thank you for that. Right. The, the, the stories made it. The life stories. So thanks for sharing with all of us especially during this important month, Black History Month. Yes, you're welcome. Anyone else want, want to be brave? No, it's a lot of pressure to unmute that button. I do have a question uh, for the panelists. Um, all right, so given everything that has been going on 2020, um, especially pertaining to um, the incidences of, that we've seen of police um, brutality and just the rise, the uproar in 2020, like, do you feel, um, do you feel any pressure to be, to assert yourselves or be excellent in certain other ways? Like how's, how has that affected how you, um, your excellence comes out in a sense uh, or has it affected or not has it changed anything how with how you operate or is it business as usual i think it's given me a new appreciation for the experiences that i've had in uh criminal justice because i've seen 
what it's like behind the curtain, so to speak. So sometimes um, when people want to have discussions about the issues, I can speak from both perspectives of what a cop might have been thinking, as well as what it's like to be a black man and have a bad encounter with the police. Because just because I got hired by a police department, those bad encounters didn't stop. I mean, there were times where there was an incident where I got stopped driving my patrol car off duty because I guess they didn't think I should have been the person operating it. So when you talk about what keeps you grounded, it was experiences like that. Those were reminders that, you know, don't think it can't happen. For me, I, for me, honestly, it's business as usual with a, with an unusual exception, which is for my own mental health, I don't engage uh, in the insanity, quite frankly. I am also very, it's very curious to me how some people believe this is new or this is, oh my gosh, it's happening so much or that, and I think, where have you been? And what have you been doing or reading or, you know, what, where have you lived where this is something, um, you know, this is not the first time that black folks have said, look, see this recording of what's happening or you can hear all the anecdotes over the years. My whole life, I've heard these stories. It isn't just that 2020, all of a sudden, there's just been this explosion right. of this, what's happening from my perspective. Um, so it's curious to me that all of a sudden, for some, this is at the forefront and this is something new or unusual or that suddenly demands action. I think what has happened, the attitudes, the policies have perhaps taken different forms, but from where, from where I'm standing, uh, it's not new. So I continue to do the things that I believe I can contribute um, in that regard, but for me, it's it's very curious to be to watch people say, "Oh my goodness," <laughs> you know, all of a sudden in 2020, this has become a problem. It, not that's not the case. Yeah, for for me, it just pretty much. Sadly, it's like a broken record. You know, for me, it's like a broken record. Um, this isn't new. Um, it still goes on. We still see the microaggressions. We still see the micro racism, you know, racist acts. We see, we still see it. So, um, it's a it's a bigger issue. And and when you talk about black excellence, it's really about taking that as fuel and making it not destroy you, but really empower you. And um, that's what we have to do with it artistically. Uh, whatever profession, whatever field we're in, that should really empower us to even be more so. So that's probably answers the question, why do we have to work twice as hard? Because it's twice as hard. You know, so that's. I would say it's definitely, it's, it, it's been business as usual because very similar to what Judge Erica said, this has been going on, this isn't, this isn't new for black people. This isn't this is new. I feel like folks, it's it's sad that it has to take someone putting their knee on someone's neck and some a grown man crying out for his mom to have folks be like, wow, okay, well, maybe we should do something. Or for a girl to be sleeping in her house, to have the police shoot and kill her, then leave. Not do anything for folks to be like, oh, we gotta do something. And right now there are a lot of organizations and schools and folks who are like, Black Lives Matter this. They got an action statement. That's cool. A few years ago it was re-entry. No one spoke about it since. So with that being said, it's to hold folks accountable to that plan. Everyone has a book list and anti-racism training, but where's the application in what's happening? I can say, I've been more pushed to hold folks to what they said, because now you said it. I didn't make that statement. You did. And once you put it on paper, it's real. Once you speak it out loud, you've spoken life to it. So now you need to follow up with it. So I would say that's what's been how I've been maneuvering is holding folks to what they said they were going to do.
Yes. Um, I'm going to ask any final thoughts from um, our panelists. If not, um, thank you everybody for your time. Um, we really appreciate everybody being able to come out here and hear our panelists. And hopefully um, you're inspired by something or um, you find out uh, what could be your next steps, whether that's through support or even if it is just getting out of the way um, and just let um, people do their thing. Because um, black excellence is like, there's no um, ceiling to it. Like the sky's the limit and um, people are, black people are going to keep pushing forward um, no matter what may be a barrier or a speed bump. Um, I like speed bumps more than barriers because nothing's going to stop us um, regardless. Um, and yeah, for all black folks out there, um, don't look for a mirror all the time because a lot of times you're not going to find it. Um, be that window for someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to learn that and I'm still learning that, that, hey, there might not be a mirror out there for me, but I could be a window for someone else, whether that is my nieces and nephews or just um, the students that I'm um, speaking with every single day or just out in my community. Um, but yes, um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, and um, yes, have a great day and be safe out there. Please uh, be safe. That's the biggest thing. We need to make it through and we're going to do it together. Um, but yes, have a good night, everyone. Thank you.